Good morning and welcome to South Point Church Online. We want to welcome those of you watching in our Southern Maryland communities. We also want to welcome those of you that might be watching in different parts of the country or maybe even different parts of the world. My name's Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point. And we just want to say thanks so much for being with us today. Hey, we're in our last week of our series about faith and fear. There's a question mark because we want to ask, what do those words even mean? mean. You see, in the last eight weeks, we've seen and heard a lot about faith and fear in the middle of this pandemic. I mean, you can't go onto Facebook without seeing a meme about fear. You can't go onto Instagram without seeing some kind of inspirational quote. And you can't go to YouTube and not see a video about these two words, faith and fear. Now, in a season where nothing is normal, it becomes even more important for you and for me and for we to understand what those words, faith and fear, really mean in a way that is why healthy, and truthful. Now in weeks one and two, we took a look at the word faith and we came up and discovered a simple truth that we're gonna put on the screen this morning. And it's this right here. Misunderstanding faith can cause dysfunctional behavior. Listen, when we get faith wrong, we don't act the way we're supposed to. We don't end up with the results that we want to. And then last week, we talked about the feeling of fear, something that all of us are gonna experience. It's not a when a if question, it is a when question. And we discovered this truth last week. Fearful decisions are often unwise decisions. And listen, none of us want to live with the consequences of decisions that aren't good. Now, if you're here today and you missed week one, two, or three, no worries. You can go onto our website or to our YouTube channel uh, to catch up on that. Now, here at South Point, our hope is to help anyone take their next steps with Jesus. So almost on a daily basis, we're creating content. And if you don't want to miss out on that content, I encourage you to like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and to follow us on Instagram if that's something uh, that you choose to do. Now, today, as we close out this series about faith and fear and what do those things really mean, we want to tackle a truth. Now, this truth is something that you, that me, that we all know deep down inside, but we rarely say out loud when it comes to this faith. And I'm going to put it up on the screen for us this morning. And here it is. Everyone bets their life on something. Listen, everyone, all of us, you see, here's the crazy thing. Regardless of what you think about God, all of us put our faith in something in life. This truth that everyone bets their life on something is true if you showed up this morning and you kind of go, I don't have any faith. It's true if you showed up this morning and you say, I have different faith. It's true if you showed up today and said, I'm a follower of Jesus. And here's where this truth gets even crazier. What we bet our lives on is never revealed in the words that we say. It is revealed in the actions that we we take. So I want us to take a look, look, look at a list of things, of common things that people will bet their lives on. I, maybe me, maybe you, maybe we, and we're going to put it up on the screen and it looks something like this. We may bet our lives on success, love, wealth, beauty, talent, maybe our work ethic, maybe it's pleasure, maybe it's fame, comfort, politics, religion, and happiness. There are a lot of things that we could bet our lives on. And here's the thing, as you look at this list, you might go, hey, there are a lot of good things on there. Matter of fact, most of them are good. Why, why would betting our lives on those maybe might not be the best thing to do? Well, think about it. Success doesn't last forever. If you love him or her, him or her isn't perfect. They're flawed. If you've been married or in any kind of relationship, you know that love is more than a feeling. Love is a choice. Well, wealth can be fleeting. Beauty fades. Talent, there's always someone more talented. Your work ethic can be done by injustice or unfairness. Pleasure, just because it feels good, doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you. Fame, well, that's short-lived. Comfort, we live in one of the most comfortable generations in the history of mankind, yet we're the most unhappy generation. Uh, politics, I don't even need to go there. Like that, if you put your hope in politics, man, you're gonna be disappointed. Religion has been used to manipulate and control people. Happiness is based on on our circumstances. Am I, say, am I saying that some of these things aren't good? No, I'm not saying that. But the question isn't, are these things good? The real question is, can any of these things really hold the weight of your life, hold the weight of my life, hold the weight of our lives? What we're really asking is, can we bet our lives on these things? And again, the answer to that question isn't in what we say, but in what we do. 
And I bet I'm gonna tell you something that you already know. And it's a truth that we've experienced. And I'm gonna put it up on the screen. And it's this, putting our faith in faulty things leads to flawed results. See, when you and I put our faith, our hope, or bet our lives in something that wasn't made to hold the weight of our life, it comes crashing down and we end up with results that no one wants. You see that list that I said, there were a lot of good things in there. But when you and I ask good things to do things that they were never meant to do, they end up being faulty. And we just set ourselves up for disappointment. And so here is my challenge to all of us today, myself included, is that we would all ask one of life's, and I think maybe life's most important question. This question is so important that I actually wrote it out and want to put it up on the screen this morning. And here's the question for all of us today. Am I, are you, are we betting our lives on something that has the power to deliver goodness, regardless of my circle, my circumstances, and my choices. I mean, if we could be honest this morning, let's think about it. You and I can't always determine the circle of people that are around us. You and I can't choose the family that we're born into. You and I don't always get to choose the classmates when we're in school or in college. We don't get to choose our professors or our teachers or our coaches. And if we're really honest, many times we don't get to choose the bosses and sometimes even the neighbors that we have. So whatever we bet our life in has to be able to handle the circle of people that's around us. What about our circumstances? I mean, you're in a circumstance, I'm in a circumstance, one that I never imagined and would never want to be in. Sometimes we'll end up in circumstances that we don't want to be in. And then the third thing is our choices. Listen, all of us want to hit the right thing as we go forward in life. We all want to get it right. But the reality is, as flawed people living in a broken world, there are going to be choices that we make that aren't right and that we regret. And so when it comes to this question, we need to ask ourselves honestly, is whatever you, is whatever I'm betting my life on, does it have the power to deliver goodness regardless of the circle of people we're surrounded by, regardless of the circumstances that we can't always control and the choices, even the flawed ones that we make? Now, in the midst of such a serious and important question, there is great news. You and I are not alone in our struggle of choosing the right thing to bet our life on. You see, God knew that each and every one of us would bet our life on something. And God also knew that humanity, not just you, not just me, but that in every generation, people would struggle with misplacing their faith and their hope in things that might not be able to deliver despite the circle, the circumstances, and the choices they made. Matter of fact, this is the very reason that Jesus came. You see, Jesus didn't come to start a religion. Jesus came to show us what God is like. And by revealing what God is like, we would be able to put our hope and trust in God. Matter of fact, Jesus himself addresses this very issue. And so what I want to do today is I want to take a look at what putting or betting our life in, what that really is all about. And if we're really honest, faith always boils down to a simple question that all of us will ask at some point of life. Now, before we dive into the eyewitness account, I want to give you a little bit of background about what's happening. You see, Jesus shows up in Jerusalem, right? He shows up in, in, in his country, right? Um, in Israel, right? And Jesus is different than the other religious leaders of the day. day. Uh, Jesus is kind. Uh, Jesus is generous. Jesus is caring. Jesus protects people. But Jesus has the power to change lives. So wherever Jesus go, there are crowds of people always around him. And one day, Jesus talks to his disciples, got this crew around him that are following him. He says, listen, uh, there's somebody on the other side of this lake. He doesn't let them know, but he says, hey, there's somebody on the other side of the lake. Their life is undone and I need to get to them. I need us to get in the boat and for you to get me to the other side. So they get in the boat and they're on the lake on the way to the other side. Now, Jesus apparently is in the kind of the underside of the boat and he's sleeping on a cushion. And this great storm comes upon this little fishing boat as they're traveling to get to the other side. Now, listen, I'm not a fisherman. I don't like being on water every once in a while. I don't mind, uh, but deep water scares me. But these were generational fishermen. I mean, their dads had been fishermen, their grandfathers, and probably even their fathers before their grandfathers. They knew when they saw this storm, how dangerous this storm could be. And that's where we pick up this eyewitness account in the gospel of Mark. And I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to put it on the screen. Now, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. 
And so you got to imagine this. The disciples are like bailing water, right? The disciples are freaking out. They're rowing. They're trying to get the other side. There's this crazy squall, this crazy storm that's just raining down. And they're all freaking out. And yet Jesus is sleeping. The disciples woke him up and they said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? In this very statement, their question is the same question that each and every one of us asks in every generation of God. Don't you care? He, Jesus, got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. So he's sleeping. They get up and they go, Jesus. It's not like they ask Jesus for help. It's they're like, Jesus, don't you care? You see, often in our circumstances, when they don't look the way we want them to, that is our first question. God, don't you care? And then Jesus gets up and he speaks to the winds of the wave, quiet, be still. And then here's what happened. It says the wind died down and it was completely calm. I mean, instantaneously, the clouds cleared, the waves stopped and everything was calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And their faith wasn't about the circumstances. It was they believed that Jesus didn't care. They said, don't you care? It wasn't about the circumstances. It was their belief that maybe God didn't care about them in that moment. And it says this, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You see, here's the truth. Faith doesn't mean that you won't have the feeling of fear. You see, in the middle of the storm, the disciples were afraid. But then after Jesus spoke to the storm and calmed it, they weren't calm. They weren't peaceful. It tells us they were what? What's that word? Just type it in. They were terrified because faith isn't about feelings. Faith is always a response to how we feel. And in this encounter, in this thing that happens, we discover a question that all of us are asking. God, do you care? In another encounter, Jesus tells us why faith is so important. Our ability to trust that God does care. And um, it's a simple statement uh, that I need to set up. Um, it's right before Jesus is abandoned and betrayed. It's right before he gets crucified. It's right before he dies and is buried and conquers hell and death. And then the tomb is empty. Matter of fact, it's just immediately after the last supper. Jesus is speaking to his friends and his disciples and he's telling them this truth. He says, listen, it's gonna go poorly. One of you is gonna betray me. All of you are gonna abandon me. I'm gonna be turned over and be tortured. And all the disciples are freaking out and going, no, it's not us. And then Jesus lets him in on a little secret and we pick it up in the eyewitness account of the gospel of Luke. And it says this, here's Jesus speaking. He says, but I have prayed for you, Simon. That's Peter. Simon Peter says, but I have prayed for you that your, what's that word? You might just want to type that in faith. I pray that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus is having this conversation with Peter and the disciples, right? And he's telling them, listen, I'm going to be betrayed by one of you. The rest of you are going to abandon me and leave me. And you're going to be kind of all messed up. But don't worry, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that your faith may not fail. And you might be asking, what does that have to do with faith and trusting in God? But here's where we discover a secret. Look at what Jesus didn't pray for. I mean, this is going to be mind-blowing. Listen, Jesus didn't pray that Peter fortunes or circumstances would change. I mean, think about it. If life really came down to our circumstances and our fortunes, then Jesus would have prayed, Peter, I pray that all the circumstances of your life will be comfortable and easy and you'll have everything you want. If life was about those things, Jesus would have prayed for that. But Jesus didn't pray that Peter's fortunes would be different. And it gets even more amazing. I mean, Peter failed multiple times over those few hours leading up to the resurrection of Jesus, those, those days. I mean, first, Jesus said, uh, Peter told Jesus you shouldn't go. And, and Jesus has to rebuke Peter and said, that's the devil speaking, right? And then Peter denies, he abandons Jesus, right? And then he denies Jesus. But notice that Jesus doesn't pray that Peter doesn't fail, that's not what he prays for. He prays that his faith, and here's what faith is, his picture of God. And in this, we discover a truth that's so important. So listen, I get you might be on your phone, you might be on your laptop, you might be watching on your Apple TV, but I'm gonna ask everyone to lean in because this truth is so, so important this morning. So if you could just, just focus in, kind of not look at the chat right now, but just, just focus on this. Here's what Jesus tells us. He tells you, he tells I, and he tells Peter. It is not our fortunes 
or our failings that will determine if we live the life that we're meant for. It is our faith. You see, despite our fortunes and despite our failings, our hope and our trust in Jesus is actually what will determine whether we'll live the life that you and I were meant for. Jesus, that's why he prays for his faith. Jesus prays that Peter would understand that God is for him. Any God that would show up in his life and, 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 and give himself for him is for him. So it's not his fortunes or his failing, it's his picture of God. And so today what I wanna do is I wanna make three brief observations about faith this morning because we're all gonna bet our lives on something. And here's observation number one that I wanna share with us. Faith and belief are drastically different. You see, there's a big difference between knowing someone and trusting someone, isn't there? I mean, just uh, maybe you want to type that in, trusting and knowing. Those are two drastically different things, right? And here's what I discovered, if I'm really honest, and like, I I'm not trying to beat people up. I'm not trying to make people feel guilty, but I am trying to be honest. Here's what I discovered. Typically, when you have faith, that means there's some action behind it that honors God. And when we just believe in God, there's usually behaviors and actions that cause us to be hypocrites. Because we say we believe in God, but our actions don't match what our words say. And it causes us to look like we say we believe in God, but our actions don't match it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, it's a true story. Uh, number one, um, there were uh, years ago, uh, I had some wisdom teeth pulled. Um, matter of fact, my wisdom teeth were what they're called impacted. They were sideways and they were kind of growing into my other teeth. And I had to have um, the both bottom sets pulled out on the same day. Um, it was it was pretty crazy. Uh, they had to like drill and like do all the stuff. And, and I had to have it um, done uh, by like a specialist. And um, and so they got done, they pulled all the teeth out and they, they pulled them and the guy said, hey, listen, um, I need you to know something. Um, when I pull the teeth out, your nerve endings or the roots exposed. And what's gonna happen is the blood is gonna clot those, okay? So I need you to take the next couple days. Do not exercise, don't run, don't do anything that's too extraneous because if you cause those blood vessels to pop, um, you'll be in great pain. Now listen, I knew this dentist. This dentist had taken care of my teeth. The dentist seemed like a good dude. I believed that he existed. I I knew that he was a dentist. I saw all of his credentials, right? But I didn't trust his advice to not exercise. I was a moron. You know what I did the very next day? I went to the gym and I worked out really, really hard. And I have a habit of grinding my teeth when I work out. And so guess what happened? I popped both blood vessels in my mouth, right? And I got dry socking. It was like two days before Christmas. So on Christmas Eve, I had to call like a hotline and have one someone fix my teeth. And see, that's a perfect example of the difference between belief and faith. And I'm asking today for those of you that have showed up to watch or that may be watching this in the future, I want to ask, do you have faith? Do you trust God or do you just believe God? And I want to ask the question is, is because sometimes we may believe that God exists and we may believe that there is a God who created anything. And we may believe that like he sent Jesus and Jesus died for us. But the difference between believing and faith is we trust God enough to do what he asks us to do, to obey his commands. Remember what I said? What we bet our lives on isn't based on the words that we say. It's based on the actions that we take. When we have faith, it usually leads to trust where we'll do the things that honor God. When we just believe in God, we don't trust that God is good. And we continue to ask that question, don't you care? And we end up trying to meet our own needs and live our own lives in a way that might not be helpful. Which leads me into observation number two about faith. And we're going to put it on the screen. Faith isn't about quantity. It's about quality. You see, here's what I discovered. You can have all the faith in the world, but if you have all the faith in the world in the wrong thing, all the faith won't save you. And you can have the smallest amount of faith, but if you have the smallest amount of faith in the right thing, it will still work. Matter of fact, Jesus says it this way. Jesus says, if you have the faith of a little, little tiny grain, a little seed that, that you would be able to speak to the mountains and throw it to the sea. And so some people take that as all I have to do is have faith and I can speak to things and they'll get thrown in the sea. But that wasn't Jesus's point. Jesus's point wasn't, it isn't about the quantity of faith you have. It's about the quality. It's in the, what do you have your faith in? Uh, let me give you an example of having time 
grounds of faith, but having it in the wrong thing. I don't know if you know this, but in the 1930s, all the way to the mid 1950s, did you know that doctors used to recommend smoking to people? Yes, you didn't mishear that, right? Doctors used to advertise and say, for a healthy lifestyle, you should start your morning off smoking with a camel. A camel's the best cigarette for your health. I mean, can you imagine that? That there were doctors who were paid by cigarette companies who said that smoking was good for you. You could have all the faith in the world that those cigarettes were good for you and that they wouldn't hurt you, but your faith was misplaced. You put your faith in the wrong thing and people still got cancer. They still got lung disease. It still was bad for them. They had misplaced their faith in something they thought was good, but it wasn't good for them. Their faith didn't change the truth that that bad thing was bad. Now, the flip side of that is also true. You can have the smallest amount of faith. I mean, you can have lots of doubts, but you can take just enough trust to act on something, have the tiniest amount of faith. But if it's in the right thing, it still works. Now, I'm gonna admit something on camera that I don't really wanna admit. Um, and it's a truth that I don't often share, but I'm gonna admit it on camera. And it's, I have a fear of heights. And one time I was with a group of friends and we were at an entertainment uh, park. And at this entertainment park, uh, there was a bungee jumping station. It was really high. Um, and I remember my friends and I were talking and we were kind of daring each other who would go. And I have a fear of heights. And I said, I'll do it. And I said I would do it not because I wasn't scared of heights, but because I wanted to conquer my fear. So I went over to sign up for the bungee jumping thing and I kept asking the same question that you would probably ask, that I hoped that you would ask. And here's the question I asked, is it, type in the word in the chat, safe? Is this safe? And the guy was like, oh yeah, it's safe, Mr. Hall. I promise you. I go, well, what do you mean? He was like, listen, you have to wear two harnesses. You wear a chest harness and a, and a, a seat harness, right? And the reason that we make you wear two harnesses is so if one of them fails, uh, the other one will be there. And by the way, we put not just one carabiner in between them, we put three. That way, all three carabiners would have to fail. And the bungee jumps that we attach you to, we don't just attach you to one. We actually attach a second line so if the first line breaks, and he said, the odds of all of those things failing simultaneously, uh, you would need a miracle for all of those things to happen. So I can remember climbing up the ladder, man. You could see the whole park as I got to the top. I felt like throwing up. I was so nervous. I was like, I might die today. I was blowing kisses to my wife. Like this might be the end of me. This is before we had kids, right? And I got to the end. And uh, if you've ever done this, kind of like when you get to the end and you're scared of something, you don't wait. So I just did like a Superman dive. And the good news is I lived. Like I'm here, <laughs> right? And so you can type in, he lived, right? But here's the reality is, is that it's not the amount of faith that we have. It's the what we have our faith in. And so I wanna ask all of us a tough question today. It doesn't matter the amount of faith you have. I wanna ask, what is your faith in? What are you betting your life on? I mean, isn't that one of life's most important question? You and I get one of these to spend and to use. And don't we want to bet it on something that can hold the weight of our life that was meant to? And so it's not the amount of faith, it's the quality of faith. What is it that can truly hold the weight of our life? And here's some of the greatest news. The empty tomb of Jesus, despite, like listen, we may all disagree with what that means, but the empty tomb reminds us that Jesus' promise that he can hold the weight of our life is the quality of that we need, which leads me into the brief observation number three, which is this. Faith isn't about understanding, it's about trust. If we are really honest, most of us are like little angsty adolescents. Uh, anybody got some teenagers in, in the house? You might just want to type in teenagers. Have you ever had a conversation with a teenager? Because a teenager seems to never actually trust their parents, right? I get it. I was a teenager. I didn't trust my adopted mom and dad. They were for me. They loved me. But I always ask the question, I need to what? I need to understand. You just want to type it in there. Like when you're a teenager, you want to understand it all. You want to know it all. As a matter of fact, when you're a teenager, you think you know it all, right? And if we're honest, when it comes to faith in God, we're often like angsty adolescents. We want to know everything. We want to see everything. We want to have complete understanding. And here's the hard part. If God is really God and he's in control of everything, then you and I as human beings wouldn't be able to have complete understanding and know everything. And so if complete understanding is necessary to have trust, then trust is no longer trust because you have all 
the facts. Now, listen, I do want to say something. Listen, trust should be earned, but it shouldn't be over explained. Let me say that again. Trust should be earned, but not over explained. And listen, we know that we can trust God. He sent Jesus. Anyone that would die for you is for you. When you look at your taste buds and eat chocolate and bacon and you you see the beauty of a sunset, right? And we see all the goodness and we see that God died for us. We, that's enough to be able to trust him. And the problem is for many of us, we have some things that we don't understand. So it causes us not to trust God. True story. I shared this uh, this past Wednesday at 6.30 on Facebook Live. Um, I kind of go live um, every Wednesday at 6.30 to connect with people. And so if you want to join, that's great. Um, but I shared a story about my adopted dad. My adopted mom and dad, uh, they're, they're my mom and dad to me. They loved me. They cared for me, right? Um, and I told a story about um, my biological mom had left me a small inheritance. And my, my adopted dad gave me some wisdom and told me how to protect that and use it. Um, and I was that angsty teenager who needed to understand it all. And I thought I knew more than him. And so I didn't follow his rules. um, And I I disobeyed and I did some things um, because I didn't understand. Only to discover by not listening to him, the only person I hurt was myself. And now that I'm older and wiser, I discovered something. When I have a really hard situation, when I'm really struggling to make a decision, not only do I pray, but I, I call my dad and I get on the phone with him. And now when he gives me advice, I know he's not giving me advice to give me his opinion, to not have his way. I know my adopted dad is for me and loves me. And when it comes to advice that really matters like parenting or finances or making decisions uh, to honor God, I trust my dad. I trust him even when I don't always understand because I know he is for me. Now listen, my adopted dad, he's awesome and he's cool, but, but he's a flawed human being. And I wonder if we have a God who would give his only son for you and I, even if we don't understand our circumstances, even if we don't understand our circle of people that have been around us, even if we don't understand even some of the choices that we've made that are flawed, that have created harm, is it possible that there's enough in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus to be able, even though we can't understand it all, but to trust him? And it leads me to the kind of the, the, like the, the summation of this whole message that I'm going to put up on the screen. God's unfailing love and his uncompromising character is the best thing that you, is the best thing that I, the best thing that we could ever bet our lives on. You see, at the end of the day, all of us, you, me, we, we're all going to bet our lives on something. So the question isn't, are we going to bet our lives on something? The real question is, what are we going to bet our lives on? And I want to challenge all of us to go, isn't betting our lives on the unfailing love of God? I mean, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. Anyone that is forgiving and loving like that, we can trust that kind of love and his uncompromising character. I mean, Jesus was so pure and so loving that even death couldn't defeat him. We can trust in his unfailing love and his uncompromising character because at the end of the day, you and I will have a circle of people that we don't always get to choose. You and I will have circumstances that we don't get to choose. And at some point, we'll make choices that we regret and we wish we didn't make. And we need to be able to answer the question in light of the circle of people and the circumstances and the choices we make, what has the power to deliver life and life to the full to us in the midst of that? And the answer is simple. It's not an organization. It's not a religion. It's a person. And his name is Jesus. What will you bet your life on? I want to ask a simple challenge about this upcoming week. I want to ask this challenge. How will your actions this week reflect your trust in Jesus. Let me, let me say that again. So as you go through this week, not the words that you say, but the choices that you make and the actions you take, how will they reveal that you're betting your life on Jesus? What would that look like? Because we're all going to bet our lives on something. And our hope and our prayer at South Point is that you, that me, and that everyone and anyone who wants to could bet their life on the one who died for us and conquered hell and death and who is alive and can give us life and life to the full. Let me pray. Hey God, thank you. 
Thank you that you love us. Thank you, God, not only do you have unfailing love, God, not only do you have uncompromising character, God, you have the power and ability that regardless of our circle of people, our circumstances, and even our failed choices, to be able to give life to us, God, to redeem the brokenness of this world and to provide life. And you offer that freely. God, we don't have to earn it. We don't have to work for it. All we have to do is trust that you care and that you love us and to say yes to you. God, I pray that anyone who's listening, who doesn't understand, or has maybe made some poor choices, or who had circumstances, that today would be the day that they say yes to you, Jesus. Not in word, but in action and deed. Thank you that regardless of our failures, that our picture of who you are as a loving God means that we can be forgiven and experience life. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless and have a great Sunday.